It is such a pleasure to have Ambassador Verasuk with us, his wife, Uma. Uma, would you stand so they can see who you are? We're pleased to have her with us. Ambassador Verasuk was appointed ambassador of the United States this past February, but he is a friend and, and has had much experience with the United States. He came to the United States uh, to take the last two years of his high school education. Then he went to the Northwest for his undergraduate program, graduating from the University of Washington. And then he went to the University of Virginia, where he obtained his master's degree. And last night we were hosted by Elder Wood of the Quorum of Seventy, who was a professor there at the uh, University of Washington at the same time. And while the ambassador didn't take class from him, they were very, uh, uh, had a lot of friends in common with the professors that he did study from. I was pleased this summer when the ambassador came at the invitation of the governor for the ASEAN uh, countries. And at that time, we had, were able to sit next to each other at dinner and become acquainted. And as we talked about his returning to, to come to Utah and speak at BYU, he was most uh, pleased to accept the invitation. He told me that uh, even in his youth, he had heard about Brigham Young University from the students that became well-known in Thailand who had studied at our university. The ambassador has a very distinguished background uh, of service. Uh, he served prior to coming here as the ambassador to France, permanent representative to the uh, UNESCO, and a member of the governing board of the, of the Development Center for the Organization of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. In addition, he's held posts as deputy permanent secretary, permanent representative to the UN office, and other international organizations in Geneva. And Director General of the Department of East Asian Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador to Canada, and Ambassador to Myanmar. He joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1974 and served as Assistant Permanent Secretary in the Office of the Permanent Secretary. Deputy De Director General of the Department of Political uh, Affairs and uh, Counselor in the Office of the Secretary of the Minister and the first secretary to the Thai permanent min uh, mission to the United Nations in New York. We're most delighted to, to have the ambassador and his wife here. He'd like to begin this session by a, a brief vi uh, video. For those of you who have been to Thailand, uh, it will take you back to your own personal memories. To those of you who have, are not acquainted with Thailand, it will introduce you to Thailand. And after that video, then the ambassador will speak to us. Thank you very much, Dean Peterson, for your kind introduction. Uh, Swati <laughs> Krab. Uh, before I uh, start, you know, to, uh, talking about Thailand, probably as uh, mentioned by Dean Peterson, uh, this is just a short video, about 15 minutes, uh, to give you a basic background about Thailand. And for those of you who have been there, I think this will just, you know, revive your memories, you know, of the good old days in Thailand. <laughs> I hope it, they're good old days. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, quite difficult. Uh, Characteristics from the utmost mountainous north to the deepest south and the perfect climate. Quality accounts for the fertility of the country and the happy smiles on the faces of the people. This is the land of smiles. This is Thailand, the gem of Southeast Asia. Thailand can be reached from every corner of the globe. 
addition to the existing spacious and modern airport, a new state-of-the-art air terminal, Suwanapum International Airport, will be opened soon, which will fully enhance the capacity to welcome more tourists who travel into Thailand by more of the world's airlines. By train, starting from Singapore through Malaysia and into the gateway of Thailand in the south. By car, the Asia Highway is convenient for neighbors from Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia and Malaysia. A cruise is also another exciting way to reach Thailand. The gateway to Thailand is open to welcome tourists from all over the world who want to have an unforgettable once-in-a-lifetime experience. Bangkok, the city of angels, has split personalities. One is that of mystique yet elegance due to the works of art created by the great masters of centuries ago. The intricate beauty and elegance is still vivid in the temples and religious structures all over the city. The other personality is modernity. Today, Bangkok is progressing to be a center of the business world. The city has been the venue of regional and global conventions and exhibitions with state-of-the-art technology and equipment catering to all levels of requirements. In Bangkok, around Ratanakosin Island, is the old community, part of which are temples, palaces and places of historical and architectural significance. The tourist may feel familiar with sunset at the Temple of Dawn. The picture, however, could not live up to the site in real life. The martial art, which makes a mark for Thailand, is Muay Thai, Thai boxing. The use of coordinated body parts is the art passed down for generations and thrills both Thais and foreigners just the same. Traditional Thai massage is the physiotherapy, which blends art and science perfectly well together. A la carte, or ready-cooked food of all nationalities and tastes, a weight to pamper every palate. Attend classes at the most recognized culinary institutes and bring home recipes from simple yet tasty local dishes up to splendid cordon bleu preparations of Thai food. The puppet show is an exceptional but rare entertainment which demonstrates both skill and perfect coordination. Also interesting shopping venues after sunset. Since the good old days, when Ayutthaya was the capital of Siam, the central part of Thailand has been rich and fertile. That's why it was the center of civilization and invaluable works of art traces of which are found in the historical park of Ayutthaya. central plains are interrelated with two things, religion and river. It is the two which mold the Thai spirit into beauty and serenity to create precious works of art 
that stun the world. The Shao Paya River is always the perfect setting for a meal. It also is the proof of the fertility of the country. Fresh from the river are fish and prawns of astounding sizes. Simply grilled, they are sweet and tasty. strips of white beaches along the east coast tempting. Sunbathing, windsurfing, or taking a speedboat to exotic tropical islands are some of the activities to enjoy. seafood is the way to go. Local fruits are not seasonal anymore. Now, all fruits can be eaten any time of the year. Tourists will find Isan the land of miracles. The unbelievable sight of the sun seen through the 12 entrances of the Phnom Room sacred structure right at the same moment. The art of rocks and boulders stacked to form sacred structures and chedis. The colored paintings on the rock walls, the telltale signs of a prehistoric age, and the archaeological discoveries preserved for generations to view. special dish originating in Isan. It is known to the world as papaya salad, the julienne of peeled, unripe papaya pounded in the mortar and seasoned well for rounded taste. There are more fun festivals of the region awaiting to thrill and excite visitors. tourists can fly up north through the mountain range, through the clouds and soft drapes of mist. Streams zigzag across the land, providing ever lush greenery to the northern forest with colorful touches of blooming flowers. For tourists, it's wonderful to see. To enjoy the beauty of nature is not enough. Let your tourists experience how the northerners stick to their good old traditions, ways which have been passed down from one generation to the next up to today. The close relationship between humans and elephants is the magnet that successfully draws people. Lama architecture is still vivid in temples and religious sites. Lana talent display themselves on handicrafts worthy of souvenirs.
One tradition which should not be missed is the canton. A set menu of local food and desserts is arranged stylishly to be a feast both for the eyes and the palate, while ethnic music in the background and a dazzling play are a treat for the spirit. Songkran, or the Water Festival, is the Thai New Year, when all Thais head back to their hometowns to celebrate with their families. No other place can beat the North for this celebration. Awaiting the tourists in the South are thousands of tropical islands, both large and small, with water so clear and tempting. Besides the beauty of nature, travelers can find daring and extreme activities here in the south, such as cliff hanging and canoeing along the coral reefs. Architecture, art and shows of the South could be highlights for tourists. The right combination of talent and experience makes Shadow and Nora dances remarkable shows. Spices and the hot taste are the characteristics of southern food. The assortment of raw vegetables served aside is meant to mellow it down. However, seafood fresh from the ocean and cooked in a simple way is already a feast to the palate. in all forms have been made ready to give a worry-free travel to tourists. Well, I hope, uh, you know, for, for those of you who have been to Thailand, you know, this will refresh your memory, you know, of uh, you know, my country. And first of all, allow me to express my sincere thanks to the Kennedy Center and also, you know, to uh, BYU for kindly inviting me, you know, to spend some time with you to talk about my country, Thailand. Um, let me start by uh, maybe... Um, telling you about a conversation I had with my counterpart, uh, the U.S. ambassador in Thailand, uh, Mr. Uh, Skip Boyce. His nickname is Skip. 
We've known each other for 20 years this, because this, uh, at present this is third tour of duty in Thailand. And uh, when we first met 20 years ago, I was director of the Americas and he was head of the political section of US Embassy in Bangkok and speaks Thai fluently. And, uh, uh, you know, the, I said, Skip, you know, the, uh, I met him just a few months after my arrival in Washington, D.C. I said, Skip, you know, uh, I'm in this town, Washington, you know, for two, three months. And it seems that uh, uh, the whole town is focused, you know, to, uh, only on the four eyes regarding outside world, you know, Iraq, Iran, and then it comes to Asia, India, Indonesia. We are not on the map at all. <laughs> And Skip said, well, he said, oh, uh, be patient. And before he came to Thailand, he was ambassador in Indonesia. And he told me in Indonesia, you know, it was everything new to us because Indonesia uh, just beginning to open up, you know, to the outside world. And it's, uh, you know, as you know, the largest Muslim country in the world, more than 200 million people. <laughs> and uh, it's it just like the window opening is opening up. So everything, when I was ambassador there, you know, it's everything new to us, so there was an air of excitement. But when he came to Thailand after Indonesia, it's just like, uh, you know, coming to a beautiful house which has already been constructed. There's not nothing much can, you can do, except maybe to do some interior decoration, add something of this or that, you know. So I think his comments reflect, you know, there's long-standing relations between the uh, United States and the Kingdom of Thailand. Uh, some of you may be well aware that uh, Thailand is the first uh, friend of the United States in Asia. Thai the King of Thailand is the first country in Asia to establish diplomatic relations with the United States in 1833. So we have long had relations for nearly 200 years. And um, uh, it was, uh, this relation was established before you established diplomatic relations with China and Japan. So we are the first country in Asia. And that's why when I presented my credentials to President Bush, I was allowed you know, to, uh, four minutes you know, with the president because there were 14 ambassadors presenting, ambass uh, presenting credentials in one hour to the president. And those four minutes include two minutes of photo session already. So I had two minutes with the president. So I, told, I used that uh, uh, little time to tell President Bush that, uh, Mr. President, you know, I represent the Kingdom of Thailand, you know, who is the first and oldest friend of the United States in Asia. And Thailand has been a natural ally of the United States uh, because in every war of the past century, you know, our soldiers fought side by side with American troops from World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War. We didn't fight in uh, the war in Afghanistan, but we sent an engineering battalion you know, to help rebuild Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan uh, for the United States. And also in Iraq, um, we were part of the UN peacekeeping force in Iraq. We sent two battalions, mainly me uh, medical, uh, medical battalions uh, to provide medical care for the Iraqi people. But we also sent combat troops to protect our medical battalion. And those combat troops did guard duty, and on one occasion, um, to our soldiers lost their lives, you know, successfully preventing um, a suicide bomber from driving uh, a bomb-laden truck into the U.S. base. So they told Mr. President, you know, uh, I believe no other country in Asia uh, has this kind of record of friendship and solidarity with the United States. So if uh, uh, you forget everything I say here, please remember this. We, Thailand is the first and oldest friend of the U.S. in Asia. And we have been long allies, you know, so we are treaty allies uh, since um, uh, the beginning of the 16th century during the Cold War. And uh, those treaties, defense treaties, uh, defense agreements with, that we have had with the U.S., you know, to, um, uh, allow us also to uh, permit the U.S., you know, to use bases in Thailand during the two Gulf Wars, in you know, the First and Second Gulf War, and also during the uh, tsunami uh, tragedy two years ago, the U.S. also requests us to use air base in Thailand as a relief headquarters for the entire region. And from that headquarters, the U.S. direct 15,000 U.S. personnel uh, to provide humanitarian relief to Indonesia, to Sri Lanka, you know, uh, to Bangladesh, uh, and uh, to Aceh, all these areas which have been affected by the tsunami. 
So this uh, relationship, you know, reflects you know the, the strong alliance and solidarity between our two countries. We are also very strong allies on the war of terror. I uh, uh, probably you, some of you may have heard that three years ago, uh, we arrested uh, Al Qaeda regional representative in Thailand, Mr. Hambali, who is also one of the masterminds of the Bali bombing. He had been hiding in Thailand. We arrested him and turned him over to the U.S. I think he's now in Guantanamo. And this, there are also other instances of cooperation of the war of terror with the U.S. So we have worked very closely with the U.S. government on this war of terror because we also understand and I think empathize with the United States regarding the dangers that we face in this world from the radical fundamentalists. And uh, the US, United States also, you know, conducted uh, the largest uh, military exercise outside of the United States in Thailand every year. It's called Cobra Go. And this has been going on, going on for 25 years. And uh, this is also an illustration you know, of the close relationship between our two countries. But I think the most important relationship is between people to people. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to, some of you probably remember, you know, the, the musical The King and I, you know, the, which was, uh, there were several versions of it, but uh, the longest running was, I think, the Broadway show by Hugh Brenner. And I remember when we was in New York 20 years ago, uh, her my sister Queen came to New York, and she went to see the performance. And afterwards, she went behind the curtain to meet with Hugh Brenner and to, to talk to him. It was just before he died, you know, and, and it was very moving, um, you know, meeting, you know, between uh, the actual queen of Thailand, you know, and, and the actor king of, you know, of Thailand at that time. <laughs> and he was a real king, you know, you bring a uh, perform, uh, that it was a real king uh, at that time. And it was, a true, it was a more or less a true story, you know, uh, because the king at that time was King Chulajam Krau. Uh, what we call King Rama the fourth, the fourth king in our dynasty, and when he was uh, he was the king who became very interested, you know, in uh, things Western, especially scientific uh, knowledge. And in, in, he was a Buddhist monk. He befriended an American missionary, uh, Reverend Bradley, who is a medical missionary, a doctor, but he is uh, quite a Renaissance man. Apart from being a medical doctor, he is also a scientist, and he brought. Uh, to Thailand, the first printing press in Thailand. And um, he also, you know, put out the first Thai English dictionary, and a copy of which, if some of you uh, were to go east, uh, is at the Yale uh, Library. You know, I saw it earlier this year. It's still in excellent condition and very beautifully uh, done, and better than our present Thai dictionary. Uh, so, you know, to, uh, through his association and friendship, you know, between these a uh, Thai Buddhist monk who later became king and American medical missionary began this uh, friendship uh, between Thailand and the U.S., which has lasted nearly 200 years. And, um, and later, uh, 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 this king, when, uh, later this Buddhist monk, when he became king, he was also the first Thai king to communicate you know, with the United States government. He wrote a letter uh, to President Buchanan uh, offering to send Thai elephants you know, uh, to the U.S. government. And if you, uh, some of you have been to Thailand, you probably heard about the role elephant in our history. You know, from in ancient times, our elephants were our battle tanks. So, you know, we also became the first country in Asia to offer military, uh, military assistance to the United States <laughs> government. <laughs> but uh, President Lincoln, it was, but it was not President Buchanan who wrote the letter back. It was, uh, it was President Lincoln who wrote, uh, who wrote this letter back to uh, our King Rama IV, expressing thanks on behalf of the U.S. government, but uh, you know, told him that uh, well, he did not believe that our elephants could withstand you know, the cold temperature of Washington, D.C. And I think for those of you who've been to Washington, D.C. in the summer, you know, just like Thailand. <laughs> So, uh, and, you know, to, and, and uh, the, Amer the image of the American people in the eyes of Thailand, you know, are very positive, uh, as all of you who have been to Thailand know very well, you know, and because uh, we, uh, during the 19th century, you know, to, uh, Thailand was also uh, 
challenged by the two colonial powers, the French from the east, the British from the west, and we had to cede a lot of territory to those two colonial powers and, uh, in order to save the core of Thailand. So we ceded you know, practically Laos and Cambodia uh, to, to, to France and the whole Malay Peninsula uh, also to the British, including Penang, which used to belong to us. And, and then also certain territories in, in, in the West, you know. And, uh, and so we were being encroached by both sides. And uh, America seemed to us, you know, the only Western power who did not have a hidden agenda, you know, uh, against Thailand. So there was a lot of trust and confidence by my government on, uh, on the American government. And during that colonial era, we also lost what we call judicial sovereignty because the colonial powers forced on us a treaty uh, that would forbid us to try any of their nationals in Thai courts. So if any uh, nationals uh, under the British or the French government, for example, a Vietnamese under the French, uh, under the French uh, colonial empire, if they would commit crimes in Thailand, he or she would not be tried in Thai court but he or she would be tried only by the French legation or embassy. So we lost our judicial independence also. So after the, second, after the First World War, um, when we sided with the Allies, we sent our troops to also to fight in France, and uh, so we were part of the victors after the First World War. We began to ask uh, to regain our judicial independence, and, the, uh, and we employ the service of uh, an American legal advisor Francis B. Sayre, who, is, who at that time was the son-in-law of President Woodrow Wilson. And he became, you know, and he was instrumental you know, in helping us to negotiate return of judicial uh, sovereignty you know, to our Thai courts. And later we appointed him, um, um, uh, we, uh, the, the king gave him um, an official title, Praya Karana Maitri, which in Thai, you know, some of you who knows Thai will understand that Karyana Maitri means um, beloved friend. So, you know, this reflects the feeling I think the Thai government had toward the Americans. And again, in the Second World War, uh, when the uh, Second World War broke out, um, the Japanese, I think, attacked Pearl Harbor on December the 7th. They also attacked Thailand at the same time. And they were landing in, 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 in southern Thailand. and. Uh, we sent words to Churchill, asking Churchill to send troops from Singapore to help us repel the Japanese. But then Churchill replied that, you know, we can't, please help yourself. <laughs> and the Japanese gave us ultimatum uh, within 24 hours. Either we join them as an ally or they occupy us, and they would disarm our troops. So we had to choose the lesser of two alternative, the lesser of the two evils. You know, we decided to become, to make a declaration of alliance with Japan and also at the same time, we had to make a declaration of war against Britain and U.S. And in the case of the U.S., the Thai ambassador in the U.S. refused to hand the declaration of war to Secretary of State Cordell Howe. And so we never became, we were never at war with the U.S. And the Thai students in the U.S. then, you know, um, were trained by the OSS, the father of the CIA at that time, to become the Free Thai Movement, to, uh, who would then be parachute down to time to usually what their main duties is to uh, provide assistance to the American pilots who were shot down in, in over Thailand. And so the relations became, you know, continued during the Second World War. At the end of the Second World War, the British came back to Thailand and demand a very high uh, reparations from Thailand, family declared declare war against the British. Again, the American government intervened, you know, and, and with the British government. So we pay only a token sum, you know, to, to the British. And this again, you know, became part of the reservoir of goodwill that the Thai government and Thai people you know, entertained towards the United States. And that's why when the Cold War broke out, you know, to, um, we joined the free will and we became ally of the United States. That's why we sent our soldiers to Korea and to Vietnam. And as mentioned to you, uh, uh, the, these relations continue very strong up until the present day. And, uh, and also in this era, uh, some of you know uh, maybe the history of our king, who we are celebrating the 60th anniversary you know, this, of his coronation this year. I'm leaving a DVD you know, about uh, his life you know, with the Kennedy Center for you who are interested you know, about his life. 
but um, the present king of Thailand, I think, also symbolizes, you know, the friendly relations between our two countries because he is the first Thai king to be born in the United States. That's 79 years ago. You know, when his father was studying at Harvard Medical School and his mother was studying nursing there, you know, and they met, they got married, and he was born there. And as far as I know, he has never renounced his U.S. citizenship. So, you know, uh, he is also the first Thai king, I think, with, uh, 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 who could be characterized as an American. And, uh, uh, I, and th that's why when I first came here, uh, one of the congressmen whom I paid my courtesy call on, Congressman Jim Leach, good friend of Thailand. Unfortunately, he was defeated in the midterm election, but he has been a good friend of Thailand. He mentioned to me, he said, look, you know, the, I went to the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., and there was this statue of Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill also symbolizes the friendship between the United Kingdom and Thailand because of our alliance during the Second World War, but also because Winston's mother was American. And your king was born in America. You know, the, you should think of, you know, just setting up a statue of him. So we'll be working on it, you know. <laughs> but at present in, in, in Boston, uh, there is a, a memorial at the uh, intersection. Uh, uh, some of you who know Boston at the Charles Hotel and the John F. Kennedy government, there's an intersection which our square which is now, uh, which has been renamed King Puhikon Square in honor of his majesty the king because it was only one block from the hospital where he was born, Mount Auburn Hospital there. So he, his Majesty the King symbolizes, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the long and happy relations between our two countries. And the king also, you know, the, uh, his passion is also jazz and blues. Uh, and since he was young and uh, uh, when, the, uh, you know, the, every time when there was a jazz musician coming to Thailand, you know, the, during the past 30, 40 years, the king would have a jam session all night, you know, <laughs> you know, with, with, uh, with, and I understand I've been told that uh, next year he will turn 80 and the American government is thinking of sending a jazz band, you know, <laughs> uh, to play his uh, composition. He composed about 43 jazz and blues songs, you know. So he's very close to America in, 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 in spirit. And uh, we had a celebration in, uh, in September in Boston at that square in honor of him and it was presided over by his granddaughter who is studying at MIT. So, you know, this is also reflects, you know, the close relationship between our two countries and people. Apart from, you know, this uh, strong alliance and also people to people in contact, uh, each year, um, for your information, there are approximately about 500,000 American tourists going to Thailand. And in addition, about 150,000 would go there as medical tourists because of the excellent medical facilities there. And uh, uh, so, you know, I would invite, you know, all of you who have been to Thailand and all of you have been there, you know, to, to return and, and, and you know, to, to enjoy the facilities there. Apart from these uh, people-to-people relations, uh, we also have very strong economic relations, uh, especially on our part, you know, we regard the U.S. as our most important economic partner because our trade with the U.S. about $26 billion a year, uh, approximately a quarter of our uh, trade with the whole world. And, um, and, uh, we, uh, and we also, uh, what you call, highly value the trade surplus we have in the United States because without that trade surplus, we would suffer trade deficit with the entire world. So we treasure very much our trade relation, and so we are right now, um, for the past two years, we've been negotiating what we call free trade agreement with the United States. We don't know yet whether uh, we'll be able to finish the negotiations in time before the fast track authority that Congress has given to administration uh, to pursue trade negotiations uh, will, will, uh, would expire in, at the end of June. But we hope to be able to finish negotiations. If not, we'll continue to come back because we regard, as mentioned, the U.S. as a very important economic partner of Thailand. And Thailand now has changed a lot from when it was growing up. And when it was growing up, we were basically an agricultural country. You know, most of the people work in the countryside. Most of the people still do. But agriculture now accounts for only about 30% of our GDP. Service is now number one. As you can see, you know, tourism is very big uh, income earner in Thailand. 
Last year, about 12 million people came to Thailand as tourists. This we expect to be about 13 million. And we just opened, as uh, shown in this picture, a new airport, Swanapum Airport, which is the largest in Asia. And so next time you go to Thailand, uh, for those who've been to Thailand, you will not be landing in Don Mueang. You'll be landing in this new airport, you know, to, and which is very beautiful. <laughs> And, 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 you know, it has very modern Thai architecture. And so, you know, um, at present, um, Thailand has changed so much in the past, I think, 20, 30 years. Uh, now we are both service industrial economy. Thailand, for example, uh, at present in terms of our industrial structure, we are the largest automobile uh, assembler in Southeast Asia. At present, we are... Um, uh, we are manufacturing about uh, 1.2 million trucks uh, per year. And in five years, uh, this figure will reach 2 million trucks per year. So we have very, very big uh, automobile uh, uh, sector in Thailand. And also, we are also beginning also to, uh, to build our economic, uh, no, our electronics uh, sector. At present, Thailand also manufactures the largest number of hard disk drives in the world. Also, because of the United States, uh, Seagate company is the first company which put up its plan in Thailand. And I was, two weeks ago, I was in North Carolina talking to the executives of uh, Sarah Lee company, you know, which own Haynes Apparel. And now they're spinning off Haynes Apparel's independent company, and they're planning to set up plans and headquarters in Asia, and have chosen Thailand to be the regional headquarters for Haynes Apparel. And we are competing with other Asian countries uh, for, the, uh, for them to put uh, you know, the apparel factory, the socks factory, and the sewing factory in Thailand. And Dow Chemical Company also established a plan. So at present, you know, the, uh, uh, Thailand is becoming, at the same time, growing very fast in the service sector, industrial sector. And uh, we very much you know, are open to foreign investment. And in this connection, uh, the American business you know, have advantage over other foreign businessmen because about 30 years ago, we signed a treaty of amity and economic relations with the United States. And that treaty of amity economic relations with the US provides national treatment to American companies you know, opening up their business in Thailand. That means that you are, if American companies were to open a business in Thailand, they will be treated like Thai companies. They will have the same rights as the Thai companies. And US companies are the only foreign companies which have been given such rights. I think this also reflects you know, the strong economic relations between our two countries. And at present, there are approximately about uh, 1,300 US companies in Thailand with uh, about uh, $3 billion. Last year, US invested about $3 billion uh, in Thailand. And, but the total cumulative investment, I think about $20 billion. So we very much welcome you know, US investment in Thailand. And f for you who have been there, you know, you know how friendly the Thais are you know, the, to foreigners, in particular to the Americans, because of this long and friendly and cordial relations between our two countries. And so you know, to, uh, it gives me great pleasure today you know, to come here just to give you a brief introduction about my, my country. And, uh, and I also hope on behalf of my government to extend invitation to all of you to visit or revisit Thailand, you know, and, and we'll be waiting to welcome you, you know, uh, with, you know, very warm hospitality. And I hope, you know, to, uh, you'll go there. And thank you very much. And now, you know, if you have any questions at all, you know, I'm uh, willing to answer, please. Uh, I think, thank you very much. <laughs> I, think I just finished in time, but maybe one, one or two questions. You know, I know for some of you have to go to classes, but please go ahead. Uh -huh. The ambassador does have a fairly tight schedule, so we'll take a couple of <laughs> questions and then invite those of you who would like to briefly greet the ambassador to come up okay. to the front. Yes. Is the situation in the southernmost three provinces getting better? Uh, we hope so, because uh, with the advent of the new government, uh, we have 
uh, right now, you know, trying to reach out, you know, to the Thai Muslims in the South. For example, I think about two weeks ago, the new prime minister went to the South and talked to about more than a thousand Muslim leaders in the South, and to urge them to cooperate with the government, you know, and addressing the problems in the South. And for the first time, also the Thai prime minister um, apologized to the Thai Muslims in the South for any harsh treatment that the Thai Muslims had in the South. But in the South, you know, the, even up until now, you know, we have a dual legal system. Uh, in terms of family cases, uh, uh, any cases dealing with family laws, we allow uh, what you call the Muslim law, you know, to, to be applied. But, you know, for cases involved, you know, the criminal uh, 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 cases, the criminal courts, you know, civil courts, then they will have to go to Thai court. So, and we tend, and the Buddhism, as you know, majority of Thailand's are Buddhist, 90 percent of them. And Buddhism uh, is not uh, what you call, uh, I would call, it's a soft religion. You know, it's very tolerant and to, to, to other religions. Uh, so there is, um, on the side of Buddhists, there is no what you call attempt to evangelize the Muslims. You know, so we, we have a live and let live situation, but of course there are some elements uh, of uh, radical people in the South you know, who long to create an independent fundamentalist Muslim state in the South, you know, having Sharia law. You know, and this is, I think, not just in Thailand, it's a global phenomenon, but something that we are trying to pursue a dual track policy on the one hand, to reach our hands to them and to see what we can do together to address the economic and social problems in the South. On the other hand, uh, we'll have to try to bring about law and order because without law and order in the South, we cannot pursue economic development in the South. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Um. The United States and Thailand obviously work together to solve a lot of issues, um, but my question is in regards to Burma. The United States um, strongly supports a UN Security Council resolution, and the United States has sanctions on Burma through the Burmese Freedom and Democracy Act. My question is, Burma being ruled by an oppressive military junta, uh, oppression that has been well documented by many international organizations, and it's something that's dear to me. I have many Burmese friends. I have talked with many former political prisoners and refugees. And I am well aware of the oppression and brutality that is going on in Burma. Is Thailand willing to put more political and economic pressure on Burma so that Burma will make progressive steps towards democracy in the attacks in eastern Burma and free Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi? Thank you. Well, let me first of all uh, quote what I told uh, Dean Peterson, just before we came to this room, I said that when I was a student just in Washington, one of my professors, Daniel Leff, told a, a student in the last of his class that in six months you'll forget everything what I learned here, but please remember one lesson. You know, where you stand depends on where you sit. Myanmar is our Mexico. We share 2,400 kilometers border with Myanmar, and only about 50 kilometers had been demarcated. So the rest, about 2,300 kilometers, were not demarcated. And we don't have the border uh, police. Uh, we don't have uh, the ability to monitor the border, as in the case of the United States with Mexico. Even the United States, I think most of you know how difficult it is to monitor the border. There were 70 natural cross crossings between you know, the two countries. And 15 million Thais live along the 10 provinces adjoining Myanmar. And every time we had a crisis, they would close the border. And instructions would be given that any Thais who would cross the border, a lot of Thais do because, you know, sometimes they went to forage something in the forest out there, would be shot. You know, and, 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 so, you know, the, the relations between Thailand and Myanmar is a very delicate one. And we have a lot of historical baggage. Uh, when I was ambassador there, I was told that in the past 400 years of our relationship with Myanmar, the two countries have fought 44 wars. And we fought 45th war. And Myanmar at present, you know, is I think had the third or fourth largest army in Asia, 
about half a million people, twice the size of the Thai army. And so um, it's a relation which is very delicate. So when American friends come to ask us, I've told them that, you know, me and my son, Mexico, the same problem that you have with Mexico, we do have, and much more serious. Because, you know, to, um, at present, uh, there are probably over a million illegal Myanmar workers in Thailand. You know, and we have no way to control the border. And our hospitals along the, t uh, the 2,300 kilometers of Burma are taxed to its limit. You know, because we have to provide medical care, you know, for these people coming across the border. So it, so we realize, you know, the, our relations with Myanmar are fraught with uh, great sensitivity. Uh, at some points along the border, our soldiers would sleep on the same hill, divided only by a written line on the top of the hill. And when it was there, we nearly went to war over one simple little hill. You know, so any wrong steps, you know, uh, that uh, we 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 take you know, can bring war between the two countries. Uh, so that's one point. And I remember when I went back from Canada to be Director General of Asia, that is Asia, one of the first crises I encountered was that at that time, the Buddhist Koreans were attacking the camps of the, uh, the Christian Koreans on our side of the border. And, uh, and then there was hue and cry around the world, including Congress why we didn't protect them. We tr because at that time, those camps were under the jurisdiction of, of our Ministry of Interior. They were protected by the police, you know, not by the army. So we moved the army, our army, to protect those uh, Korean camps on our side of the border. Uh, the, the Burmese drew back the Buddhist Korean armies, their proxies, and then put one division across the border, complete with SAM uh, uh, missile sites. They were ready to confront us along the border. So our, even though me and my South Mexico, and we suffer the same problem of a massive influx of illegal migrants with all the social and economic problems, you're not facing with half a million uh, army across the border. So. Ours is a very sensitive situation. So uh, people tend to say that we are very close to Myanmar. Myanmar government. I was ambassador for three years. I could say it was not true. You know, the relations with Myanmar, uh, I'm trying to remember a quote by Churchill when, when uh, he was talking about, you know, the, uh, about the relations with Russia. I think in the British Parliament, and he's saying that uh, you know uh, sometimes you know to, uh, you have to deal with existing reality. We have to deal with whatever government which is in power in in Yangon in order to manage the border relations, uh, because as I say, the first and primary duty of any government is the protection of the safety and welfare of its citizens. We've got 15 million people living along those borders. If we have crisis, if we have war, they will suffer. You know, so the relations we have with Yangon, what I would recall is that what we aim is called manageable relations. We must be able to manage relations with the government in Yangon uh, in order to prevent any misunderstandings which could lead to war between the two countries. And at the same time, if you look at our history of humanitarian records, you know, we on our border with the West, there are more than 100,000 Korean refugees who have lived in Thailand for more than a decade. And you know, they have lived there for more than a decade. You know, and, and, and they could not go back. And we provide humanitarian relief for them. We allow uh, the humanitarian relief of other organizations to reach them and to provide protection. We allow them to be educated in our schools. You know, we extend medical facilities to them, so much so that my friends in the uh, Ministry of Public Health, when I was Director of East Asia, complained to me 
the Thais could not get into the hospitals along the borders because they were all full of Burmese patients. Yes, that's right. That, uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. But what 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 is? Uh, but what I'm trying to tell you that what's uh, what's the choice that we have? You know, the choice that we. Uh, no, uh, because I'm I'm trying to say that you know what we're trying to do is that we have a manageable relations with Myanmar in order to prevent a war between the two countries. But at the same time, we continue to provide humanitarian relief to all those refugees who live, um, uh, who live along the border. More than a decade. They are provided with education. They are provided with food. You know, and we are waiting for the day you know, when Burma becomes democratic, that they can go back. And we have always told them, you know, every Thai delegate go them and urge the, central, uh, urge the Myanmar government, please talk to the ethnic groups. Please reach peaceful understanding with them. You know, uh, we have done that. You know, but uh, there is not much stick that you know we can we, we, we can impose on them. And if you look uh, at the situation in Myanmar now, uh, uh, at present, you know, China is building an oil pipeline uh, to Myanmar to the Indian Ocean. And India has just declared strategic partnership with Myanmar because India needs, you know, oil and gas from Myanmar. So you know, uh, there's not much stick that we can use against them. What we can do uh, to them is to try to talk to them and say, look, you know, you are, um, you are, you know, the, uh, your situation in Burma has you know, being a great burden to Thailand, economically and socially, you know, for more than two decades. You know, please, you know, trying to reach peaceful uh, negotiations, you know, with the minorities. And for them, they, uh, for, for in the situation in Myanmar, they have always told us that, you know, the principal duty is to prevent, you know, the fracturing of Burma like Yugoslavia, because Burma is a country which has seven large ethnic groups and about 130 smaller ethnic groups. And they feel that you know, the moment they will relax uh, their whole, the country would fracture along the line of Yugoslavia. So we have been talking to them and trying to find ways to encourage them uh, to you know, listen to the, cry, uh, to the demands of the international community. But as you know, they are military government. And uh, they feel quite safe, you know, the, with the friendship they have with the two uh, great powers along their neighbors, both India and China, and also with Russia. When I was ambassador there, I was being flown around the country in American helicopters, the Bell helicopters that was provided by DEA. That was about 10 years ago. I went back, I was back there again three years ago. And then we were being flown uh, to different places in Myanmar by Russian helicopters. So, you know, there is certain strategic reality that we must live with. But at the meantime, at the same time, it doesn't mean that, you know, the, uh, we have not tried to talk to them. We try. Nobody knows how hard we try. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>